norm. And as it becomes more of the norm, it becomes a safe practice. And I think that is how we're migrating towards full compliance. Um, we, we, as I've said many times, we do not live in a police state, nor do we want to. We do not want law enforcement or code enforcement to go out on a regular basis and make sure that people are doing the things that they're supposed to do. We expect them to do that. And, and it's one of the expectations you should have in a democracy is that people follow the rule of law, that they don't just get to pick and choose which rules they don't follow. Because if you want, the, if you want a democracy, then you can't be an anarchist. Thank you. Next question goes to Morgan Krakow with the Anchorage Daily News. Morgan, if you have another question, please go ahead. I do thank you. Um, Mayor Berkowitz, you mentioned that it seems like more people are wearing masks now. Um, how are we able to gauge this individual level uh, mitigation practices, like whether the mask order is actually uh, being complied with, whether the gathering size limitations are, are working or not? Well, we do some survey work, which we, we publish regularly, and the survey work, work is, is very clear that more, more Alaskans indicate that they're following the masking orders. And, and, and so that, that's the empirical information we have. It's, you know, it's as empirical as, as any kind of uh, uh, survey work can be, and people always uh, scrutinize it very closely. But also anecdotally, as you look at uh, the mask order being in place here in the municipality and, uh, and people who travel outside the municipality, will anecdotally relate that things are, that people are much less masked up in other parts of the state. Um, conditions are different here. You know, we live in a much denser situation. Um, but, but all the evidence that, that we have shows greater compliance with masking. Thank you. Next question goes to Alexis Fernandez with KTUU. Alexis, if you have another question, please go ahead. Mayor, one of the common things that we're hearing from business owners is that the city is not communicating mandates with them. Do you think that you can be doing anything differently to help bridge that gap? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. We're going we're gonna to always work harder to, to communicate better. Um, and this is clearly something that, that we, we, we need to do. And um, we, we try and communicate as best we can. Uh, people forget that we're a small city. We have a relatively small staff. We push things out as hard as we can and as best we can. But there's also a responsibility on the part of the business community to be paying attention. Uh, I don't expect every business owner to be listening to these briefings, but I expect representatives of those businesses to be paying attention and to pass on the information that, that, that we're disseminating here. And so just as we have a responsibility to push harder and make sure the communication gets out, people need to, uh, to listen harder. We're in an emergency, and you cannot be passive in an emergency. People need to be much more than spectators here. They need to be participants in solving the problem. Thank you. Next question goes to Tegan Hanlon with Alaska Public Media. Tegan, if you have another question, please go ahead. And I didn't want to say anything about, wait, can I just back up? I didn't want to say anything, but I will now, I guess, is we do not have a lot of media in this town. And because we don't have a lot of media in this town, it is not easy to disseminate information. And it is a challenge. And so this is part of the challenge of living in the, you know, this stage of the 21st century is the normal channels of communication that are, your grandparents might have used don't exist anymore. There's not one newspaper that everybody reads. There's not three TV stations that everyone pays attention to. So it is much harder to communicate to everybody than it once was. Tegan, if you have another question, please go ahead. Sure. Um, I guess one, one question just to follow up on the fisheries uh, question earlier. Do you guys have any update, or can you just provide any clarity? It seems like there have been other fishery workers who have been brought to Anchorage, including most recently from Kodiak Island. 
Um, like, can you talk about how many people from out of state at this point are coming to the hospitals here? What what that capacity looks like? Just any clarity on on who's coming? You know, what COVID patients is Anchorage seeing from from out of the city? Sorry, not the state. Yeah, I, I can answer that question partially. So, um, well, uh, mostly. Uh, some of the questions are going to have to go to the state and some of those have to go to the companies that are moving those people um, around the state because we don't have all those details. Um, but what I can tell you is that we have set up a new part of the mayor's report where we ask for the number of um, individuals from the businesses that um, are operating the fisheries, how many they actually have here, um, and how many of them are quarantined, how many of them are isolated and so we're going to get that information and that'll be included in the weekly report. I don't have it um, yet for this week. I'll be getting that today and I'll include it. But last week we reported that Stewart Base Ocean Beauty had 130 positive quarantined or um, isolated here and then the um, American Seafood's at 118. 91 of those were positive and 28 um, were quarantined. And so if you have further questions about those particular companies, you can contact them. Um, as a media entity, but I will do my best to update the information and inform the mayor when we have movement in the city, but I won't always get that. Um, and whether or not they've been hospitalized and those kinds of questions, you would have to ask the state or the um, company. Thank you. But the Next. cannery that was here, so I just want to be really clear that Copper River Seafood, those, those are our residents. They live here. They're a part of our community. They're not... Um, brought here from somewhere else. They live here year-round. They work here year-round. Um, so that's why that one was a little bit unique um, and different. And Copper River Seafoods has been working um, hard uh, with our teams and um, making all of the right kinds of things that need to happen to make sure that we continue to have workplace safety in the future. Thank you. Next question goes to Emily Goody Kunst with the Anchorage Daily News. Emily, if you have another question, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, when emergency order 15 expires at the end of this month, um, what will need to happen this time differently um, to make sure that uh, we don't have another surge in the city? Well, I can start on that. And I think what we know, and I'm sure Ethan will have something to add to that, is that this is just like when we turned on um, in May. Um, and it's at first, everybody's, you know, still following the really good distancing and masking and not going out and gathering and not doing large group activities and not doing um, um, those activities. And then slowly over time, that increased. And as that increased, our cases started to go up and the disease started to spread. So it's really going to be um, a question of, like, this valve turning on and off or, you know, it's going to be a policy decision about how you want to go forward with that. But the community members that live here um, have to be motivated enough um, to, and, and continue on the good trends that we're seeing in these surveys about their personal activity behavior, um, participating in large group activities without masks, um, inside and outside, um, and just make those lifestyle changes so that we can um, get to better uh, pharmaceutical interventions like vaccines and other things that are going to allow us to have some normalcy, but this is going to be going on um, for some time into the future. So really... Um, Hopefully that the community will remain cautious, um, make really great decisions about how they're going to spend their time, um, and be thoughtful about how their actions might um, spread the virus. Thank you. Mayor, with that, we are out of time. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, and apologies for those who were tuned in at the, and uh, hope to maybe ask questions, but unfortunately I have some place I need to be very shortly. This is a difficult time for, for all of us, but, you know, we have endured difficult times before, and when you measure the degree of difficulty that we're confronting, um, we're still able to have a functional society, and we're still able to live in an incredible place. The people who live around us are still the same neighbors that we had before the pandemic began. And so we have incredible strength that we can draw on. We have incredible resources that we can draw on. And I think we ought to hold out the aspiration that people should look at what we're doing and say, Anchorage and Alaska did things in the right way. They didn't do things in a partisan way. They didn't do things based on any of the many divisions that exist in our community. 
They did things because they rose and answered to their better angels. They showed the discipline to do things in a way that allowed us to contain this pandemic and carry on with as much normalcy as possible. You've seen in a, across the country, they're starting to open schools because they exercise the discipline to do things in the right way. You see, you're seeing in other parts of the world where they're starting to have much more normalcy because they showed the discipline to do things in the right way. We know what the right ways are. They're not easy. They're not ways that we're accustomed to, but these are the things we need to do in order to have as much normalcy as possible. Wear a mask. Maintain six feet of, of separation. Wash your hands as frequently as you can. And be kind to one another. Be kind and be tough. Because if we are tougher than the disease, we can beat it. If we are fatigued as we confront it, it will beat us and we will be in this vice for a lot longer than we need to be. So I know the people of Anchorage. I know the people of Alaska. And this is a state that has the capacity to rise to great challenge. And yes, there will be those on the fringe who would drag us down and divide us. But those are the distinct minority. Those of us who believe that if we act together, we can contain this virus, have to stay the course. Because as long as we stay the course, as long as we're kind to one another, not judgmental about one another, not rushing to false accusations about one another, as long as we focus on the end goal, we can get there. So let's do the right thing. Let's do it for the right reasons. And let's remember how fortunate we really are. Thank you all very much.
anyway, that's the point. That's, that's what I was trying to do. Thank you.
So just want to con okay. Uh, just want to confirm, uh, Mr. Peterson, are you with us on the phone? Mr. Perez Verdia, are you with us on the phone? Yes, I'm with you on the phone. And then, Ms. Kennedy, are you with us yet? Ms. Kennedy, are you with us on the phone? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I am. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Test, test, one, two, three. Test, test, one, two, three. Good. All right. Cool. <laughs> sure. Test. Okay. Awesome. Yes, it should be in the box. Well, don't worry. Okay. All right, are you ready? Yes, Mr. Chair. All right, I'd like to call this uh, special meeting of the Anchorage Assembly to order. Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Ms. Quinn Davidson. Here. Mr. Constant. Here. Ms. Kennedy. Here. Mr. Rivera. Present. Mr. Dunbar. Here. Ms. Allard. Here. Mr. Weddleton. Here. Mr. Perez Verdia. Here. Ms. Zalato. Here. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson is excused. Ms. LaFrance? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Next, we have the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Ms. Van Clausen? To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Vogel, can you read the land acknowledgement? Yes. A uh, land acknowledgement is a formal statement recognizing the indigenous people of a place. It is a public gesture of appreciation for the past and present indigenous stewardship of the lands that we now occupy. It is an actionable statement that marks our collective movement towards decolonization and equity. The Anchorage Assembly would like to acknowledge that we gather today on the traditional lands of the Denina Athabascans. For thousands of years, the Denina have been and continue to be the stewards of this land. It is with gratefulness and respect that we recognize the contributions, innovations, and contemporary perspectives of the Upper Cook Inlet Denina. Thank you. Uh, point of order. Uh, yes, Mr. Wilson. Um, and this is a small thing, maybe, but we got an email from someone a week or so ago who said we need to switch our flags. Should, apparently, there should be nothing to the viewers left of the U.S. flag. So maybe Suzanne could slide that over. So I, I googled um, Mr. it. And so it, so yeah. Be before we do that, um, okay. I did uh, explore this issue, uh -huh. and I haven't gotten to a final resolution yet. So I'd rather not do it wrong. Um, so let me work with. Um, the, our attorneys and others to figure it out before okay. we change it. Okay, that's fine. Thanks. I appreciate you bringing that up, though. We have explored it. He's so, uh, there's a few viewers to do, worry about it. Do you want to speak to it, Ms. Howard? Or other than what you said? I would just like to 
John is correct on the, the flag issue. Okay. Sure. Um, so with, with that, uh, we can go ahead and change it for today, and then we can continue exploring. I just don't know if we got final resolution on that. <clears throat> I appreciate that. Okay, so um, before we uh, move on to our one action item on the agenda today, item 4A, resolution number ARAR 2020-293, uh, a few things, uh, two things. Uh, first is, uh, as members know, this is our first meeting with the new system. So uh, I would ask your patience as we deliberate on this one item today. Um, in case the clerk needs some additional time, if there are various motions or whatever may happen. Um, so I want to thank you in advance for your patience. Second, as was emailed out to the members earlier today, we have approximately eight individuals who signed up to provide audience participation. Uh, most, if not all, of those eight wanted to testify specifically regarding the proposal we have before us. AR 2020-293, um, per consultation with um, uh, Mr. Gates and others, uh, this item, uh, per our rules, does not require a public hearing. Um, so if there is will of the body, we could move to change the order of the day to take up audience participation before we take up item 4A. And if there is such a will, now is the time to do it. Move to change the order of day to take up item five. Second. Uh, first. Moved and seconded. Um, so this is one of those things where we're going to have to move a little bit slower. Okay, would anyone like to speak to the motion? I am in the queue. Uh, Mr. Constant. Thank you. I, I, uh, despite the fact that I want to hear broadly from the public on our CARES Act funding, and we are set to do that on Tuesday, I think that the purpose that I asked for this meeting, and I'm not alone, and it takes six members or the chair to call me, but is to appropriate swiftly the $7.5 million, the $7 million that we have in this resolution. And I think that, um, Essentially, we're allowing these individuals, if they speak today, two bites at the apple for their testimony, uh, if their testimony is for expanding these dollars. And so I don't support it, and I understand people do. Um, and for my part, I won't be able to stay much past 2.30. Thank you. Seeing no one else in the queue. Mem Mr. Peterson, uh, have you joined us? Yes, I'm here. Great. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. <clears throat> With that, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, Mr. Presbyterian. Yeah. yeah, can you just repeat the item that we're voting for right now, please? Sure. So it's a motion to change the order of the day to take up audience participation before we take up item 4A on our agenda. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Perez-Verdia? Yes. Mr. P. 
Peterson. Yes. That motion is approved nine to two. With that, we're gonna go ahead and move on to audience participation. We have eight individuals on the list. So first we're gonna call uh, Carolyn Cookerts. Please leave your name and number and I'll give Next, <clears throat> we have uh, Alex Perez. been forwarded to an automatic board. Thanks. Uh, next, we have Jack Amon. Hi, uh, Mr. Amon, this is Felix Rivera. You're here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on audience participation. We have not yet taken up the item before us. You have three minutes. Welcome. Okay, and um, go now. Go ahead. Okay, well, um, I just, uh, my understanding of this meeting was to talk about using some of the CARES money that is the municipal coffers to help uh, restaurants during this shutdown. Is that correct? Correct. Hello? Correct, yes. Please continue. Okay. Okay. So, um, um, for, for where we're at now, during this, during this thing, even when we're open, um, we have experienced a 50-something percent decline in revenues. We have managed to stay afloat with the aid of a PPP loan and an EIDL loan. Unfortunately, my PPP loan is about expended, and um, unless the, um, the Fed, federal government gives us another bite of the apple, I'm afraid we're going to run out of funds before um, um, before the end of the year. So I think, especially with how hard the hospitality has been hit, we certainly would appreciate um, some of that grant money available to us under the state program if you received more than $5,000 in either of the federal programs you weren't uh, allowed to apply for the Alaska CARES grant. So um, that's kind of where we're at. Even when we were able to open, even at the max capacity because of the social distancing requirements, we were still running at less than half capacity. So this is a real long haul for us. I, I don't have any catering business going on. Um, I'm trying to keep my employees employed, and that's what we're going to need some help with. And that's, that's pretty much pretty much my my spiel. Thank you uh, for participating. What uh, that? Thank I you. I mean, so I would like to see some funds available to restaurants during this time. Um, that kind of mirror the state CARES Act grant program. Now, how you determine how much everybody gets 
and how that's administered is beyond me. Um, but um, that's, that's the kind of help we need. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Patty Mullins. And as we are dialing um, Ms. Mullins, if members have any issues or need help with the new on-base system, just raise your hand and Mr. Dennis Wheeler will uh, sweep in to assist. Good afternoon, Sheldon Transition. Can I help you? Hi, is Ms. Mullins available? This is me. This is Melissa. Hi, uh, this, so this is Patty Mullins. You know, I have to apologize. There is like a really strong echo uh, from your phone. I, I honestly cannot understand you too well. Um, do you want me to give you a call from my number and see if it is all clear? Uh, let, me, let me just try this again. Oh, yeah, that actually sounds better. I got Great. It. Um, okay. So, is is this Patty Mullins? Just to clarify. Oh no, I'm sorry. This is this is Melissa. I thought you, that was the echo. I thought you were asking for Melissa. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm I'm looking for Patty Mullins. For Patty. Okay. And you know what? If it's okay with you, I'll just take down your name and number. She's on the other line right now. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, thank you, uh, Miss Mullins. Uh, so. We are actually in the middle of an assembly meeting and taking public testimony, and this is the number oh. that um, Patty gave us. So, um, so we we are going to go ahead and um, move on in our testimony. But thank you so much. Oh gosh, thank you. Yep. Okay. All right, bye. Next, we have um, Pete Burns. Hi, Mr. Burns. This is Felix Rivera. You are here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on audience participation. We have yet to take up the item before us regarding the funding for tourism and hospitality industry relief. You have three yes, minutes. Welcome. Okay. Uh, one of the reasons I, I think that you know there needs to be some consideration for the hospitality industry in Anchorage is. I've been in the hospitality industry for 25 years, from large corporations to mom and pop operations. And historically, the uh, income ratio for one of these operations is anywhere from five to ten percent. Uh, so, what, what's being said is, for every dollar you're making a nickel to a dime, and that's just an industry standard that usually comes from the National Restaurant Association for any verification purposes. Some places may make a little bit more based on the type of product they are serving. Uh, so, but, but but the general consensus is it's you know at most 10 percent profit. Where I see an issue taking place in Anchorage is most of the restaurants in Anchorage, 90 percent of their profit comes from the three to four month window of the tourist season uh, from May till September. The fact that that window is not here this year, what's happening is these businesses won't have the ability to have that nest egg to get through the lean winter months. I'm, I'm, I'm a realist in the sense that I see that it's probably going to be a 12 to 18 month recovery for the hospitality industry uh, in Anchorage and possibly within the state as well too. But anything that could go to the industry to help offset, not losses, but just help offset some of the fixed costs such as leases, mortgages, uh, any fixed costs with respect to uh, utilities or anything like that would probably go a long way in allowing business owners to funnel some money towards some other costs, like getting caught up with uh, creditors and vendors, because that has been an issue that has been kind of on the back burner, is once the first uh, shutdown hit, a lot of the creditors started tightening terms on a lot of their, their, their accounts. And once businesses got back open, those terms were shortened, and uh, the terms were, uh, you know, you were going from net 30 to, net seven and now going back into a 
shutdown scenario that we're currently in for the next 22, 23 days, these businesses, the cash flow problem is significantly uh, exacerbated. I think anything that can go, and I mean, I, I'm not necessarily a fan of the $600 that the federal government put out, but I think it needs to be some kind of happy medium. And, and this is not a stimulus that I think should just go to the, the businesses themselves, but the hospitality workers are bearing the brunt as well, too. Uh, I've read some studies to where a lot of the hospitality workers are single parents. The fact that they might not have health care, they might not have daycare for their kids in the fall if kids aren't in school, is probably going to be a burden for them as well, too. Uh, anything that can come from the municipality through the Federal Government's CARES Act is going to be a benefit. Uh, I don't know if it's going to ever be enough, but I do think that, you know, any, any semblance of uh, an olive branch coming from the municipality toward the hospitality industry would be greatly appreciated. Thank you for your testimony. All right. Next, we have Mike LaHoy. Hello, it's Mike. Hi, Mike. This is Felix Rivera. You are here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on audience participation. We have yet to take up um, our one item, the funding uh, of a tourism and hospitality industry relief program. You have three minutes. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, uh, dear Assembly members, uh, my name is Mike LaJoy, and I'm addressing the Assembly on behalf of the partners of Hook, Mine, and Sinker, doing business as Humpy's Great Alaska Nail House, Flat Top Pizza and Pool, and Sub-Zero Downtown. Uh, we opened our doors in 1994 for beer lovers, by beer lovers, along with great local seafood. And over our 26-year history, we've provided over 4,200 jobs to the Alaskan economy. With the initial COVID shutdown order on March 16th, we tried takeout for about a week, and we realized with no one downtown that this was not sustainable, even after AMCO allowed changes for takeout of alcohol weeks later. Also, using a third-party delivery would cost 25 to 30 percent thus reducing our already slim par, uh, profit margin to non-existing. Initial relief from the FBA PPP loans afforded Hookline and Sinker 10 weeks worth of payroll expenses. We are now 20 weeks into the damages incurred, and there's no definite end in sight. On May 6th, after almost seven weeks with no revenue, we reopened our doors under Phase 1 restrictions, which allowed us 25 percent capacity. Over the month of May, Sales were down a staggering 85% from the year before. June, sales were down 75%. And July, sales were continuing to slowly improve, but were still down 70% from the previous year, even with the tighter restrictions back to 50% capacity. Now, with the new August 1st reset anchorage, we're hit with no indoor seating restrictions with only three days' notice. Businesses like ours depend on tourism in the summer to put money in the bank and to get us through the winter. We don't have access to corporate resources pulled from out-of-state locations that may not have suffered the same financial loss, and our compliance with the city and state mandate constantly changing has crippled our ability to fill empty seats with local bodies. We have always been diligent in our efforts to help uh, prevent the spread of COVID-19 in Anchorage. Without relief, we could be forced to close permanently this winter. Humpies has been giving back to the Anchorage community for over 26 years, and right now we're asking for the community support of our industry. Our story of economic hardship is one of only many in Anchorage's tourism sector. <clears throat> we strongly encourage city and state officials to use the disaster rate available to support the industry's hardest hit in this crisis. We recommend that 100% of the funds being reallocated from the state to the tourism industry be pushed out through a grant program targeting small, locally owned, non-franchised tourism sector businesses. Humpies and so many companies like it are staples of the Alaskan economy and important to our community's character and vibrancy. Our industry has taken a severe financial loss in the initial hunker down order issued in March and has the most to lose in the upcoming weeks as the municipality has navigates the efficiency of emergency order 15. The impact of this crisis on the nation's tourism industry are well documented and devastating. In Alaska, these impacts are further exacerbated by our state's remoteness. What our industry needs and what other states have done to support their tourism sectors during this crisis is grant support to help lessen the blow and increase the chances 
that this sector of our economy makes it through this. Apologies, we appreciate sir. The uh, this you are out of time, but I have a question for you. Uh, Mr. Dunbar? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. LaJoy, you brought up something in your testimony that I hadn't thought of in a, a few weeks, but early in the summer, I know, had been brought to us but hadn't been acted on, and that was the delivery services. So my understanding is that's a reference to apps like DoorDash. Is that correct? That is correct, yeah. So my understanding is they, they take a commission of something like 25 to 30 percent. Is that right? That is accurate, yes, sir. So other cities have passed ordinances that mandate that that be no higher than whatever it is, 10 percent or 15 percent. Um, do you have any sense of how those mandates have worked in other cities? Are they working well? Do they cause these apps to be pulled out? Or what's your sense on that? I, I, I really don't have any um, data on that whatsoever. Um, but I think that it would help lessen the blow to our local businesses if, if you were to take a similar action. So, so you would support an emergency ordinance that did that? That is correct, yes. We'd appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Oja. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Allen? Yeah. My other question is um, places like Fred Meyers for groceries and stuff delivered too. Is this something, Chair, that we could take into consideration um, with, with what he's saying? Because I didn't catch everything he said because of my hearing. If somebody could chime in and, and add, is that relevant? Um, so the uh, what you're speaking about regarding delivery of groceries right is this, uh, that's that's not an item that we have before us but happy to no uh, i mean and sorry but in regards to what he just testified on is he including I, no i didn't okay. i didn't hear that in his okay. testimony thank you thanks thank you so much for your testimony next we have uh, mr lee ellis and just as a reminder, if any members are having issues with on base, just raise your hand and Dennis Wheeler will be there to assist. Hi, Mr. Ellis, this is Felix Rivera. Uh, with the Anchor you're with the Anchorage Assembly. Uh, we are currently on audience participation. Uh, we have yet to take up uh, the authorizing the funding of a tourism and hospitality industry relief program. You have three minutes. Welcome. Thank you. And, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd just like to extend my appreciation to the entire assembly for hearing us today. Uh, as you've heard from, uh, you know, just a couple folks here in the industry, uh, we're looking at very um, definite and, and difficult situation here for the, the next couple of weeks as we comply with EO15. Um, and as many of you know, I sent out a proposal that both the Brewers Guild of Alaska and Char put together over this last week since the implementation of EO15. Um, and what we're asking the Assembly to do is to at least consider uh, a proposal that is a targeted and specific um, financial assistance to an industry that is being uh, specifically uh, affected by a local mandate. So uh, that's basically what we're trying to say is we've worked on a formula that we think would be very successful in helping the industry survive the next 30 days and assist other businesses that may be able to be open but very limited to uh, at least stay current and, um, and survive this time. We have a long road ahead of us, and even if there were a uh, vaccine tomorrow, our industry is still looking at 18 to 24 months, and, and we're basically asking the union to, uh, to take a look at what we're offering and, and consider that as, as a good solution to helping all these industries who are in, in dire need at this time. Thank you. I have a question for you, Ms. Solitel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your testimony. Um, do you have a sense if industry members um, are already applying to the small business programs that were put in place um, earlier. I believe that was a total of six million dollars allocated. Yes, I am aware of uh, a few businesses that have applied for it, um, but what we're finding is that just that six million, and even with this additional seven, spread across a, a broad range of industries, will be. Uh, 
may be insufficient or most likely insufficient to help folks put the lights on. Um, so we appreciate the, the consideration of further allocation of another $7 million, but we're, we're looking to use a, a very specific and targeted program um, in order to address a very immediate need um, that has been, you know, created by EO15. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Ellis, and I appreciate that answer to Ms. Zalatel's specific question about the prior money from the municipality. I wanted to ask, and I, we've corresponded about this a little bit via email, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on the record about whether you or similar uh, businesses are applying to the $290 million of state funds, what that experience has been like, and uh, when you hope that that money might start coming to you guys. Thank you. That's a great question, and um, certainly a lot of us who are leaders in the industry have been pushing very hard with the legislature to change the qualifications for their state CARES funds, and we've seen some changes, and this week they allowed uh, 516 organizations to apply, which is helpful, um, but we, we think that by the time the state will come back together to possibly change these qualifications, it may be too late for numerous businesses in Anchorage. Um, and furthermore, because this is a specific localized mandate, um, we're hoping that anchors can help us out in the interim, and then maybe all together we can maybe push the state to, to allocate those funds uh, sooner than later. But uh, mostly this is just such an emergent issue, and that's why we're, we're coming to you with our request. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Mr. Mike Edgington. Hi, Mr. Edgington. This is Felix Rivera. You are here with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on audience participation. We have yet to take up the item before us on the Tourism and Hospitality Industry Relief Program. You have three minutes. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'm, uh, my name is Mike Edgington. I'm uh, co-chair of Gober Board of Supervisors, but I'm speaking mostly in a personal capacity. Um, we obviously, as a community, we've been hit really hard by uh, the trickle of tourism this year, the decimation of the tourism industry and also um, a lot of our hospitality industry has been has been hit hard throughout the whole summer and then again with the uh, with the recent uh, emergency ordinance. I think the emergency ordinance is ne necessary. It's a pity the state hasn't acted. Um, in the bigger picture, it's uh, it's very disappointing the state has abdicated their responsibilities in, uh, in distributing the federal care uh, money which is intended for small businesses. Having said that, we have a we have a, an emergency now, and a problem right now um, amongst the hospitality industries across the municipality, particularly in our corner of the municipality. So I do urge the assembly to allocate some more money, money, uh, more funds in that direction. Um, one thing I would point out is there are there are items um, in the broader package um, which probably could be funded from later tranches of the uh, 150 or so million um, that don't necessarily have to be from the immediate first tranche, whereas the problems we're having in the hospitality industry are problems that are happening right now. It's cash flow problems and problems that need to be solved immediately. Um, that's really all I wanted to say. Great. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next, we're going to go back to uh, Alex Perez. Mr. Perez tried to call us, so he should be available. This is Alex speaking. I can help you. Hi, Mr. Perez. This is Felix Rivera. Um, you are with the Anchorage Assembly. We are on audience participation. We have yet to take action on the Tourism and Hospitality Industry Relief Program. Uh, you have three minutes. Welcome. Well, what I'd like to address with the Assembly today is the fact that our industry is obviously at the forefront of being on collapse due to all the mandates that have been put forward since March. 
it is imperative, I think, that the assembly look at the situation and address that this $7 million, though, I think all of us would appreciate them, uh, the money, we need to look at more funding for our businesses. Some of us have been out of revenue since March in upwards of $2 million. And this $7 million being distributed through this large group of businesses in Anchorage, I don't think it's going to make very much of a dent. As Jack Ma mentioned earlier, some of the PPP loan money that was taken earlier in March by some of these businesses is running out. And now with this mandate of closing until the end of August, and who knows, it could go farther, is just putting our industry on the brink of being decimated. We employ thousands of people. We are in need of severe help. And though some mandates have been passed where some people can do outdoor seating, some are unable to, we need to take a long, hard look at assisting our community, the restaurant community, the hospitality community, and the tourism community, and do what we can to ensure that when this pandemic is over, all of us are still able to offer what we do to our public and maintain a business life that some of us have been in for over 20 years and some even long, as long as 40. I think that if you discuss with the members of the community that are in this industry, you will see that the numbers are going to be so large that $7 million is not going to make a dent anything that we are doing to try to get us back to being somewhat solvent. I ask that you reach out to the community members, reach out to the industry leaders, and there are many of us who have not been contacted by any forms of our city government in any way. And we have voice, and we are smart people who have ideas, and as a group, I would hope that we could come together and see a solution. That's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we're going to go back to um, Patty Mullins. We got a correct number. Hi, uh, Ms. Mullins, this is Felix Rivera. Um, you are here with the Anchorage Assembly. Um, we are on audience participation. We have yet to take up uh, action on the Tourism and Hospitality Industry Relief Program. You have three minutes. Uh -huh. Welcome. Pardon me? Uh, hi, uh, you have three minutes for audience participation. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you. The, I had done a written testimony as well, and I just wanted to say that I think that um, as far as the restaurant industry goes, I feel like that it has been um, targeted unfairly. I feel like that it is foolish to think that by closing down the um, restaurant industry in Anchorage, that people are not going to go north and go to the Matsu to restaurants and where there's no mandates and go to this festival that's coming up back, that's coming up, and then come back to An Anchorage. But as well, you can go south and do the exact same thing fish, go out to eat, do any of that. And so to think that we are in the middle of those two communities and we are the only ones that are being shut down, I think that if that's the way it needs to be to curb the virus, then it needs to be across every community, not just the English community. Because people um, are losing money, people are losing their housing, people are losing... <clears throat> 
all kinds of things, especially with the school being shut, being online too. And the restaurant industry is my second job, and with the second shutdown again, it has put me into a very um, bad financial situation. So if we're going to flatten the curve and if we're going to do all these things, I feel like that it needs to be across the community where you not just the Anchorage specific area. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. With that, that ends our list for audience participation. We're going to move on to our main item, so resolution number AR 2020-293, resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly authorizing the funding of a tourism and hospitality industry relief program. What is the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Ms. Allard? Ms. Allard, I have you in queue to speak. Okay. Um, Ms. Allard? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few questions for the administration, if I may. Um, the first question is, um, have you it, uh, vetted the plan put forward by Char and the Brewers Guild for the $21 million? Chris, are you on the line? Do you want to uh, take that first crack at that question? Uh, through the chair, yes, I'm happy to. If she could repeat it, it's somewhat hard to hear on the phone sometimes. Sure. Uh, it was whether or not the administration's had a chance to review and um, go through the uh, program or the relief package uh, suggested by Char and the Brewers Guild. Uh, thank you for repeating that. Yes, Chair, Assemblymember Zalatal. Um, yes, we've been in uh, communication with the various uh, groups, uh, including the Brewers Guild of Alaska, uh, Alaska Char, and then the Alaska Hospitality Retailers Association. Um, we met with uh, uh, Char uh, and uh, the Brewers Guild yesterday, um, had a chance to go through the, the proposal with them um, and ask some questions and uh, sort of vet the, the proposal, as well as offer some alternative ideas to the proposal as far as uh, how it could be implemented. Um, uh, and so, yes, we've, we've had a conversation with them about it uh, and uh, as recent as yesterday afternoon. Great. Thank you. May I ask my follow-up question? Um, so the other question is related. Um, the AM attached to this suggests that uh, we need to get relief to these two industries quickly. So what's the proposed rollout or application and distribution timeline, um, and how does that look? Um, are we talking about generalized grants or something more specific, like it has been suggested by Char in that um, particular arrangement? Through the chair, great question, Assembly Member Zalatel. So the uh, rollout or the, uh, the methodology for distributing grants um, is something that's definitely still being discussed between the various entities and parties that we've been engaged with. That includes not only the, the uh, hospitality industry representatives that I listed earlier, but also direct contact with our nonprofit partners who have handled uh, grant distributions and programs like this in the past to understand the the capacity as well as their thinking about equitable ways to distribute funds as quickly as possible to directly impact and benefit um, the, the individuals and the businesses that are affected by EO15. The underlying premise has been that uh, we want to help individuals first and foremost um, as well as provide relief to the businesses that continue to have accounts payable due and uh, utilities and rent and other expenses that they just can't put on pause. Um, what f final form that takes, I cannot describe to you right now because it's, it has not been um, uh, decided which would be the most equitable way to do it. It partially depends on the question in front of all of you all, which is, um, how much money should uh, we allocate to this? And, and the reason I say that is because the methodology, for example, 
um, uh, not the not the methodology from the char letter, but the methodology that was re recommended by another trade group um, that roughly approximates the methodology used for the PPP program. Um, it it gets quite expensive quite quick, and so the ability to provide um, uh, meaningful benefit to as many affected uh, businesses and individuals would be would be small. Keep in mind the the title of the appropriation is hospitality and tourism, and so um, we want to be cognizant of that fact that we want we're trying to provide benefit to uh, an industry that's definitely involved in tourism, but is not solely a tourism uh, business. Thank you. I had one last question. Thanks. Um, so you you've queued up my my third question um, quite well, which is what is the expected reach of the seven million dollars as you um, as you've thought about it? Um, do we have an idea of how many businesses um, or how many um, tourism and hospitality businesses we would likely be able to reach, or at potentially what level of funding? Through the chair, uh, through the chair, great question, Assemblyman Zaltel. That is a hard one to answer because, the, uh, as you learned in the previous work session, um, there's roughly $50 million of different types of economic in, uh, assistance that are being proposed for CARES Act funds that are not just uh, this $7 million for hospitality and tourism. How does, uh, how does that impact uh, uh, the, business, the businesses that are um, feeling the effects of COVID-19 uh, COVID right now is tough to quantify. And, and what I mean by that is a business that applies, that, that is a hospitality business that applies for, um, if this is a grant program, um, there also could be opportunities with the uh, small business and nonprofit uh, grant funds that still exist that you've already appropriated um, that were, a, that were uh, issued through a, you know, a, a uh, random drawing and a flat amount given to those uh, to those businesses. So um, uh, I can't remember which member asked the question. It was hard to hear, but somebody did ask uh, one of the callers earlier if they had applied for uh, some of the other grant programs. And I would include um, the municipalities small business grant program that we did last month as as one of those uh, that they could have applied for. So. Uh, very long-winded answer, but the short, the, I guess the shortest way to summarize it is there's, there's going to be multiple avenues for uh, hospitality and tourism businesses to receive relief from the federal, state, and local government, and this is one of them. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. LaFrance? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, actually, I, I had put myself in the queue to ask some of the questions that Ms. Zelatel raised, and I just wanted to go back to the methodology of the $7 million calculation. And um, this is to Mr. Schutte. And I, I don't have those details as far as the level of need that some of the folks who have reached out to us have spoken to, but I believe that $7 million is way inadequate to address what the industry or both hospitality and, and tourism needs, it's probably going to need to be um, significantly higher. So I'm wondering if you would speak more about that calculation that brought you to $7 million. Yes, thank you. Good question through the chair, Assemblymember LaFrance. Um, uh, I, I, I wish there was a, some science to it, but um, really what we were looking at is we looked at the um, uh, number of uh, uh, businesses that are registered as a uh, bar or restaurant or brewery, for example, and we were able to look at that number and extrapolate from that a reasonable expectation of relief uh, that could touch as many of those businesses as possible. I think one of the hardest things in this entire exercise is the realization that of all of the businesses that are being impacted by COVID-19, no amount of CARES Act funding is going to make them whole. And so uh, in trying to provide uh, some level of relief that is 
uh, more than meaningless, uh, but obviously will fall way short of replacing lost income. Um, we're trying to balance the needs of many different industries that are all being affected across across the city. Thank you, Mr. Schutte. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Constant? Thank you. For my part, I'm hopeful that we pass this as it is clean uh, with the sum that's here, recognizing that we'll be back on Tuesday with a full public hearing, allowing all the public and their interests to be before us so that we can contemplate any increments or pulling money from other aspects of the proposal that we have already before us. And so it is my hope that we uh, hold the line here and communicate to the public that this is not the last action, but the reason we're acting now is because we heard loud and clear this is a crisis happening right now. Thank you. Mr. Dunbar? Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a question for Mr. Schutte. So during the public testimony we just took, or audience participation, we discussed a little bit with some of the business members about the $290 million state program. And one of the testifiers expressed that they thought it was a legislative issue. But my understanding is it's largely been an administrative issue, the requirement that if you receive more than $5,000 in PPP funds, you cannot uh, receive part of that $290 million. Uh, I've also heard that this week perhaps there had been some movement on that. So, Mr. Schutte, can you speak at all to that about how businesses might be able to address the $290 million state funds that have not gone out, which obviously dwarfs is twice as much as we could possibly give out, even if we dedicated every cent that we have to this? Yeah, thank you. Through the Chair, Assemblymember Dunbar, great question. Um, uh, and there's, there's two parts to the answer. I'm going to just uh, defer to my colleague, Mr. Bakkenstedt, on the um, PPP and EIDL uh, prohibition that exists. But more broadly, to the $290 million that is out there, we uh, be believe very strongly that a large portion of that should be allocated and could be allocated administratively for tourism and hospitality businesses in particular without a legislative solution. Um, we have had uh, several phone calls with the governor and more specifically the governor's staff this week as we try to develop that um, that request and uh, get the, the state interested in that idea. I, I'm not a betting man, so I couldn't tell you, uh, you know, how that's going to go, but at least we've been having the conversations and making the case that this industry, more so than uh, most others in the state, has been um, disproportionately impacted and to the degree that they have flexibility administratively with the uh, with the CARES, AK CARES funds, that uh, we would like to facilitate that kind of allocation. Um, but I'll hand uh, the mic over to my colleague, Mr. Bakkenstedt, on the PPP question. Yes, thank you, through the chair, uh, Assemblymember Dunbar. Uh, I, it is our belief that based on the lawsuit that was filed, I believe, by some individuals in Juneau and the decision that came down a couple of weeks ago specifically on this uh, specific uh, issue and how much administrative flexibility does um, the state administration have. I believe it was quite clear that uh, the court said, we're going to give you a lot um, because we are in the middle of a pandemic and it is uh, somewhat difficult to uh, get the state legislature um, back to kind of deal with some of these issues. So we're going to defer to the administration in terms of some of these decisions. So from our perspective, uh, you know, I, I believe that they do have the authority to uh, move some of those dollar amounts around, but that is a decision that they have made that they are going to keep it at $5,000 for, um, or if you have received more than $5,000 in PPP or EIDL, you're ineligible for um, the AK CARES. Uh, that I do believe um, uh, the application went live again yesterday, um, but I have not gotten an update on how many folks have uh, applied in the last kind of 20, uh, 24 hours or so, or what that experience has been like, because I know it wasn't easy uh, when it first went live. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, 
two points. First, to getting to a question that Ms. LaFrance um, had asked um, regarding the $7 million. Um, so uh, initially, the um, proposal had, uh, I believe, $5 million. And then I believe it was actually Ms. Kennedy who had requested that the proposal that we bump that up to $7 million. So that is how we got to that $7 million number. Um, getting to the points that Mr. Dunbar was making, uh, unfortunately, Commissioner Anderson with the Department of Commerce, Community, and Economic Development couldn't be here today. <clears throat> but I did reach out to her office to ask her to come and speak to these issues. Um, in lieu of um, the commissioner not being able to be here, I did send in some questions, and um, they get to um, the answers get to some of the points that Mr. Dunbar was making. So, first, regarding whether the Alaska State Legislature would be able to fix any of the issues through the normal legislative process, um, the response I received from the department was the only issue that the legislature may be able to assist with is the $5,000 limit for businesses that received PPP or I EIDL. But the other issues, the administrative application issues, uh, they cannot assist with. Speaking to the administrative and application issues um, on Thursday, so yesterday, the online application portal went live and um, applicants have been applying. I do have the number. So the, they have received 360 applications since going live. Um, so it seems like um, there are businesses applying, and I in, in, hope and encourage businesses to um, continue to apply. I'm sure that there's more and that could be done on the state level, and we should continue to encourage that to happen. Um, I want to agree, lastly, with Mr. Constant's um, statement and hope that we can take quick action today on this, and then if there's additional action that we need to take, we do that on Tuesday. Thank you. Move okay. to extend by 10 minutes. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any opposition to extending the meeting by 10 minutes? Okay, seeing none, then we're extended. Uh, next, we have Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the reminder of how we got to the $7 million figure. Um, there's so much frustration and despair right now among members of the tourism and hospitality industry that um, it is my intent actually to amend to both Section 1 and Section 2 to $10 million each um, because in the last couple of days since our meeting last Friday, I have since learned more about the impacts on these industries. However, in light of what uh, you, Mr. Chair, have said and what Mr. Constant has stated, um, if, if the intent or we can come back to this and, and just get this initial amount out quickly, then I would hold on those amendments. Though I would like to, um, I see there are other folks in the queue, and I will give some thought to if maybe there's some verbiage we can add here so that it would make clear to the public, as Mr. Constant pointed out, that um, this $7 million figure is not like the final figure on it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I just want to say that thank you for the folks who called in and emailed us and that I'm sorry. I'm sorry that COVID happened and that it's impacted your businesses disproportionately. And um, I'm also sorry that your state doesn't stand up for you. And, you know, the muni, we just stay busy. And I think most of us try not to speak about the poor execution um, by the state. And we try to just keep busy. You know, we got $10 million out there for childcare. We approved a mortgage and rental assistance program. We've been doing all kinds of things to get money into the hands of the Alaskans who need it. Meanwhile, there's $290 million sitting there that your governor is doing nothing with. And that is incredibly frustrating. It's incredibly frustrating to represent individuals whose businesses are falling apart and be able to say, I'm sorry, we don't have enough money. And as busy as we're working, we can't get access to that state money that's just sitting there. So this is a call to the governor. Please take action. Please help Alaskans. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Weddleton? Uh, thanks. Um, so I think to uh, probably uh, 
Mr. Schutte and Baca said that, that we had a letter from the um, Economic Recovery Committee, Bill Pop, and the uh, task force, and uh, they had said a uh, request of $10 million for the hospitality industry, and it was uh, some grants, I think, to businesses, but largely focused on augmenting um, unemployment payment to the workers. Have, have you considered that, or, and is there a um, way to augment unemployment payments? Great question, Assembly Member Weddleton. Um, I, I do think there is uh, some concern about the concept of uh, augmenting or, or supplementing uh, the unemployment benefits, and you heard a little bit of that in some of the public comment earlier. Um, the, the concerns being uh, that many of the businesses that rely on uh, industry, the you know, hospitality industry workers, had a hard time. Uh, ramping back up uh, once businesses were starting to reopen because the unemployment uh, benefits were were uh, more generous than the, than someone's um, tipped wages. So um, lo the the concept of a supplement to unemployment benefits has not been a, a strong contender in the discussions that we've had about ways to uh, help the affected uh, employees. Um, that, that being said, the, uh, the Economic Resiliency Task Force letter uh, requesting $10 million, um, I, I am aware uh, we got it. We have met with them uh, last week as, or earlier this week as they put it together and, and transmitted it. Um, they were aware that the Assembly had already allocated five and two, um, and so they, they of course, thought, uh, recognized that, that $7 million, um, uh, needs to go further, and so that's how they landed on 10. They, they, uh, they also did send uh, a very similar message to the governor, um, and the, the message to the governor was uh, in line with the statements made by Assemblymember Quinn Davidson uh, and some of the statements I made about um, administratively holding back or, or setting aside some of the AK CARES and making that um, available to hospitality and tourism applicants only. Yeah, I follow up on one question. Uh, and I think, actually, Ms. Vogel, are you uh, in to answer this one? So we'll go ahead and do that and then follow up. See you, Mr. Wells. Thank you. Sure. I just wanted to say that uh, we have been investigating and uh, in discussions with the Department of Law at the state uh, to make sure that uh, benefits that are provided uh, to individuals don't disqualify them for unemployment. So trying to sort of uh, gather information so that our money can play nice with state money and doesn't uh, disqualify people from receiving funds from other sources. So um, I wanted to let the Assembly know that that's something we're um, actively uh, looking at and, and have some good answers. The, the short of that one um, for the Assembly's information is that wage replacement is not allowed um, uh, if you want to still have the person be uh, eligible for unemployment. Wage replacement is the sort of thing uh, that you should step away from. Thank you. Back to you, Mr. Wellington. Did you have a follow-up? Uh, uh, yeah, sort of. Uh, um, I, I just on the grants that we might give, it would I guess I, I would hope that we won't have restrictions so that um, people can't get the grants if they've gotten funds from other CARES Act or other or PPP and so on. Would we create that barrier or would we not? Uh, through the chair, uh, through the chair, Assembly Member Weddleton, I think that's a great comment. And if we've uh, learned anything from our initial round of small business and nonprofit stabilization funds, it's that we should not put any sort of prohibitions in there um, because even recipients that took advantage of PPP or EIDL, uh, many of them still are suffering financially. So um, it is not our intent to prohibit recipients of federal aid. Thank you. But uh, if, if I could just add on a little bit um, through the chair, um, that that uh, obviously part of the discussion that we've had is what the state is uh, setting on top of theirs. So while we certainly will not be putting any of the uh, restrictions on receiving state or other federal funding to receive ours, uh, folks need to realize that that might not be true in the reverse. Um, so we can't guarantee that if you receive hours that all of a sudden you're ineligible from receiving something from the federal or state government. Um, hopefully that is not going to be true, but I, I do feel that we need to at least say that so folks understand if there is a higher likelihood of receiving 
uh, more funding from some other area than from us, that that needs to be taken into account. Thank you. Ms. Sally? Thank you. Um, I would just want to respond a little bit in regards to Ms. Quinn Davidson. And I admire her passion and I respect her point of view. And although we might all want to take different paths of how to get to where we want to go, I do believe we all have the final destination of how we want it um, to be resolved. But I would like to say that in, in light of um, blaming the state for where we're at isn't quite accurate. Um, there are other boroughs and other locations within the state of Alaska, such as Kenai, Soldotna Peninsula, along with the Matsu, who have followed the governor's guidelines and mandates and are successfully opening their doors and retaining and maintaining their livelihood. And here we are as a municipality tying the hands of our small businesses and not allowing them to move on and move forward. And I believe that that is what's holding up our economy from recovering. And I just hope that we can all come to an agreement sooner than later and pass this $7 million, which I still don't think is enough for small businesses. But we are here today to do that. And um, I, I agree with the body, we need to pass this as quick as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Not seeing any further discussion, members may proceed to vote. Yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. motion. Yeah, I think so. Here we go. Our first vote. Ms. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Perez Verdia. Mr. Perez Verdia? Mr. Peterson? Yeah. Was that a yes, Mr. Peterson? Yes, that's a yes. Uh, that item passes 10 to 0. Uh, with that, that brings us to the end of our meeting. We are adjourned. Madam Chair, why was uh, Mr. Perez-Rudio marked as recused? Is that the new absent?